Welcome to this presentation of the Grassroots Health Scientists Answer Your Questions webinar series. This is Carol Baggerly, Director of Grassroots Health, and today we have with us Dr. Robert Haney to do a presentation on nutrition and medicine, the troubled relationship. As many of you know, Dr. Haney is Professor of Medicine at Creighton University and is Grassroots Health Research Director. He's also a leading vitamin D researcher and a specialist in the field of nutrition. Does this trouble between medicine and a nutrient need to exist? Dr. Haney, it's all yours. We'll be talking today about the relationship between nutrition and medicine. One might have thought that there is a very natural connection there because nutrition is fundamental for health and of course medicine is about health as well. But unfortunately, the relationship which has gone back over a century has sometimes been troubled. And that's what we're going to be discussing. In my presentation, I'm going to spend a few moments thinking about how it is we need to think about nutrients and disease. I'm going to talk about the way responses occur when you change nutritional intake. And that's called a sigmoid curve because the response curve looks like an S. I'm going to talk as an example about some of the problems with our troubled relationship. I'm going to use the sodium problem, which you may have read about in the news in the past few months. I'm going to talk also about the foolishness of requiring randomized controlled trials in order to provide the evidence with respect to nutrient intake recommendations. And finally, I'm going to suggest a number of guidelines or prerequisites that are necessary for the study of nutrients in order to establish whether or not they produce a particular effect. So that's what we'll be covering. First, thinking about nutrients and nutrition. And we're going to go back for a century. 100 years ago, the prevailing model or paradigm in medicine was that all disease was caused by external forces, that is, either infectious agents, uh, germs, viruses, etc., or various environmental toxins. But in 1918, E.V. McCollum, who was the father of uh, nutritional biochemistry in this country, was asked to address a joint session of two standing panels of the American Medical Association. And in this, he called attention to early research showing that diets lacking what we now know today as vitamins A and vitamin B1 produced disease. Now, we would take that for granted, but what kind of a response do you suppose he got? He was literally laughed off the stage. Now, 1918 is not all that long ago. My father was 29 years old at the time. The, uh, the AMA and, and medicine generally held that a diet sufficient to allow you to do your daily work, that is, that provided the fuel you needed, the energy to do the work, that diet was adequate. And the idea that not eating something could make you sick was considered nonsense. Uh, we kind of scratch our heads at that and say, well, surely they knew about vitamin C and scurvy. That had been done back in the 17th, uh, 18th century. Um, and Christian Eichmann, who just a few years before in the Dutch East Indies had, had found the cause of beriberi and had treated it with uh, uh, nutritional uh, measures. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, how could there be this uncertainty or this uh, this negative approach to nutrition? Well, uh, it turns out that the foods concerned were just of one piece with other botanical remedies for other diseases. As a matter of fact, most of the remedies that we had available back then didn't come from the chemistry lab, didn't come from uh, from biochemical scientists, they came from pharmacists who work with plant extracts. We had foxglove for dropsy, and that's, that's a, that of course is digitalis for congestive heart failure. And we had cincona for ague, well, and of course that was quinine for malaria. Uh, and, and neither of those was a nutrient. Uh, they were simply plant products, and uh, they were helpful in human disease. And so thinking about uh, citrus fruits and scurvy and uh, thinking about um, uh, rice bran uh, for beriberi, 
Yeah, this wasn't any different from Fox Club for Dropsy, as far as that goes. Uh, it was just that they weren't conceived of uh, as nutrients. Uh, but it wasn't until uh, McCollum had fed animals synthetic diets and from which he could withhold certain components that it became clear that, in fact, not eating something could make you sick. And that's the position that the AMA flat out considered ridiculous. Now, I'm sure we learned better, uh, but it took a long time. Uh, in the first quarter of this past century, there was a disease in the southern part of the U.S., uh, southern Europe as well, that was epidemic and that it caused thousands of deaths, not just, not just illness. It was called pellagra. And we now know it today as a deficiency of a vitamin. It was niacin or nicotinic acid. Uh, but it became so severe uh, that the Surgeon General of the United States asked one of his epidemiologists, a man named Joseph Goldberger, uh, to find the cause of this disease and to begin working on doing something about it. And he began that work in 1914. He quickly became convinced that pellagra was a, a nutritional deficiency disease, and he conducted experiment after experiment showing that that was indeed the case. Still, the American Medical Association resisted that. As recently as 1931, I was four years old then, JAMA published an article claiming that pellagra was an infectious disease, despite the fact that Goldberger had shown that it couldn't be transmitted from person to person, even with blood, but it could be cured or prevented simply by a healthy diet. Well, sooner or later, we were able to absorb that information, and yes, today, we do recognize deficiency disease, but have we made much progress? Here's a paper that was published just in 1998, 15 years ago. It, it, it was 80 years after E.V. McCallum's first encounter with the AMA. In this paper, Goodwin and Tangham talk about the attitudes in academic medicine in the United States about micronutrient supplements, short for vitamins. They detailed what they called the scornful, dismissive treatment of nutrition in the two major internal medicine textbooks. And they went on to describe how that dismissal of nutrition by medicine had led to all kinds of nutritional quackery and excesses. And today, as I say, we recognize that deficiency disease is real disease. But for the most part, we think it's confined to third world nations or to marginalized sectors of the population. We presume that current intakes in healthy people walking around in the developed nations are mostly adequate. Now, this presumption, unfortunately, treats deficiency as overt disease. That is, if you don't have beriberi or scurvy, then you're not deficient in terms of thiamine or vitamin C the nutrients related to those two diseases. So you can't be deficient if you're not sick. And it fails to recognize that instead of that, the classical deficiency diseases are just the most severe expression of nutrient inadequacy. And the primary roles of adult nutrition uh, are the preventive maintenance of the organism and the optimization of the response to biological stressors. Now, what do I mean by preventive maintenance? Well, it's the same thing we do when we change the oil in our car or we lubricate the joints. Uh, if we fail to do that, the car runs perfectly well tomorrow and next week and next month for that matter. It's just that damage accumulates and sooner or later the motor breaks down and wears out. And that same thing happens with our bodies. If we have a bad diet, we get by tomorrow perfectly well. Just, just. Just look at our teenagers. Uh, some of the foods they eat and some of their dietary mixes uh, are horrible, but they seem to tolerate it perfectly well. There's a long-term cost, however, for bad nutrition, and it's the absence of preventive maintenance. Furthermore, uh, you can see immediately that medicine emphasizes harm. It's back to the old paradigm. Uh, well, if it wasn't caused by a microbe, it, it's maybe it's caused by by a toxin. And so there is this tendency to treat nutrients as toxins. And the poster children for that are 
sodium and cholesterol and saturated fat. And more recently, the past two or three years, calcium supplements. All of these are deemed to be uh, substances that can cause harm to the body, and you have to watch your watch your intake. Now, I want to hasten to point out that, that the concern about calcium supplements has been totally disproven, so I, I, mean, I don't want anyone to go away from this talk to uh, think that uh, there is a toxic problem with calcium supplements. I cite this simply because there is this tendency for medicine still to drop back into the toxic mode of thinking about things. Yeah, let me shift now to talk about the sigmoid response uh, of most nutrients, that is, the, the, the way the body responds can be described by an S-shaped curve. Uh, this is illustrated here in this nutrient response curve that comes right out of the dietary reference intake book published by the Institute of Medicine. Uh, once again, you see the, the tendency to emphasize harm because what we're talking about is risk of harm on both axes. On the left-hand side of the diagram here, we have a risk of deficiency, and so harm is rising as, of course, you have a deficiency of the nutrient. That makes sense to us. And on the far right side of the diagram, we have risk of toxicity. So risk rises when you get too much of a nutrient. And, of course, that's true. This is a generalized pattern for all nutrients. And these symbols in here stand for the estimated average requirement, the recommended dietary allowance, and the upper-level uh, intake. Uh, which are standard for most uh, nutrients, and you'll find if you check in the DRI volumes for, uh, for all nutrients. Now, what I'm going to do is focus here on uh, this left-hand portion of the curve because we're mostly interested with the problem of deficiency and getting up to where you'd like to be. Uh, notice, of course, here, even in this uh, diagram, uh, that harm is minimized when you get up to a certain intake, whereas if you're below that, then there's a risk of harm there. And I'm going to turn that upside down, <coughs> and there we see our S-shaped curve. Um, um, uh, the benefit rises as intake rises uh, until you get up to a certain point. Now, this is kind of the standard model for pharmacology, that is, for the way enzymes work and for the way drugs work in the body. And this, this S-shaped curve spans three orders of magnitude. That is from 1 to 10 to 100 to 1,000. That's three orders of magnitude there. Um, uh, and, uh, but with nutrients, uh, the curve is compressed into a single order of magnitude, just, from, just, just by a factor of 10, and you've got the whole range of everything from deficiency to toxicity. For example, with calcium, uh, 99% of the population have intakes between 200 and 2,000 milligrams per day. Uh, that's just one order of magnitude. Uh, the same is true for other nutrients as well. Now, there are some implications from that, because within that range, there will be no response regions, typically at both low and high intakes, down here at the bottom of the curve on the left and up here at the plateau region on the right. And what that means is that if you if you don't give enough nutrient on the left-hand side, you won't see much response. And by the time you're up at the top, giving more nutrient doesn't produce any more response. That makes perfectly good sense, but it's very important to understand that that's what this sigmoid or S-shaped curve is all about. Now, uh, let's uh, take a look at a specific situation. If we were to do a study in which we increased intake by the amount shown here, what kind of a response would we get? Well, you wouldn't get much of a response because it's still down at the bottom end of the curve. Uh, and unless you had a very powerful study, uh, you'd say, well, this effect is negligible or it's not statistically significant or something like that. Now, if you take the same intake, but you now give it to people who have a different starting value, who are already up to where the other one would have gotten them, well, here's what we see. And you see a very exuberant response. So the same nutrient now given to people with a different basal status, produces a very different response. This one's easily detectable in any well-conducted and well-designed study. Then finally, exactly the same intake, once again, but now given to people who are already up toward the top of the curve, well, they don't get much of a response once again. Well, that is to say they've already got the response, they don't lose it, 
but giving more nutrient doesn't give them any more benefit under the circumstances. Now, is this just a theoretical concern? No, it's not. <clears throat> uh, here is what we might have, might have found in certain studies. For instance, here's the low intake and there's the high intake. Uh, and you see immediately that there's not going to be much of an effect there because they're all many because they're already right up at the top of the curve. Well, this was a mistake that was actually made in a multi-million dollar study conducted by the National Institutes of Health, the famous Women's Health Initiative study, uh, and the calcium and preeclampsia prevention study, both of which tested the effects of calcium. One in older women in the prevention of fracture, and the other in pregnant women in the prevention of preeclampsia. Well, uh, it turns out that even the baseline control group had a high calcium intake, so naturally giving more calcium didn't produce more of a benefit. That doesn't mean calcium is without benefit, it's just that you can't see it if you start up there where they've already got the full benefit. Now, exactly the same thing happened down here uh, in another set of studies. Uh, if the low intake uh, for vitamin D was down where I show it and the high intake was there, once again, you don't see much of a response. This was done for the vitamin D arm of Women's Health Initiative. It was also done by a big trial in Great Britain entitled the Record Trial. Uh, they were way down on this left-hand end, and they didn't give enough to get up on the curve. So naturally, they didn't see much of a response. Uh, these, these points illustrate why taking into consideration this S-shaped or sigmoid curve is critically important if we're going to evaluate whether a nutrient has a particular effect. And as we've said, it's got to be in a range such as we see here. Uh, intakes such as these are required if the effect is to be found. Now, uh, things get more interesting. It turns out that most nutrients are multifunctional with response curves that vary system by system. For instance, in this diagram, I've shown three different curves for three different body systems, whatever they may be in, for whatever nutrient. I mean, A may be, for instance, for bone, B may be for skin, and C may be for uh, for the immune system, uh, the response to infection, et cetera. Something of that sort. Nutrients act in different systems, and they, uh, they have different response curves. Now, let's say that we design a study. We're interested in outcome A and system A. And we design a study on the right portion of the curve, and we get a nice effect. It's easy to see, and it produces a statistically significant effect. But if in the same individuals, in the same study, we look at the effect in system B, we see it's not very big because, of course, the curve is shifted to the right. And if we look further into system C, what do we see? Almost no effect at all. Now, the results of such a study might be reported in saying, well, in system A, vitamin, vitamin X, whatever the nutrient may be, vitamin D in this case, yeah, vitamin D may be important for this system, but it doesn't seem to have much of an effect in other body systems. Well, that's simply not a correct way of stating what was found. It was stating that if you look for the, for the range that works in system A, you're not going to find an effect in system B or C. So we don't know whether it has an effect there. We just weren't able to show one way or the other. I'm going to go through a large data set that uh, actually worked out how we did this kind of thing. We worked with grassroots health uh, people uh, uh, who, were, uh, uh, who were under contract with this foundation in Calgary. And we were asking the question whether vitamin D status had any effect on insulin resistance or on blood pressure uh, in members uh, who had enrolled in this foundation but who did not have a diagnosis of diabetes or high blood pressure. And here is the, a set of the characteristics of the, of the enrollees. You can see there are over 4,000 individuals. They were about 40 plus years of age. Uh, they were slightly more men than women. And, and otherwise, their characteristics, they were overweight like most of us are. Uh, but the critical feature here is that they had a relatively high value for vitamin D status. Now, uh, uh, this is about 50% uh, higher than we found with the typical uh, individual walking around the central part of the United States, for example. The, the advantage of that is it gave us a very broad range of vitamin D status values in which to evaluate um, the role of vitamin D in either insulin resistance or in blood pressure. And you need that if you're going to be able to deal with uh, 
with systems that may have their sigmoid curve uh, displaced to right or left along the, the intake axis. So this was a real advantage here. Now, here's a kind of a rough presentation of what the data looked like. And you can see immediately that we're kind of looking for a needle in the haystack here. We have insulin resistance here on the vertical axis, and we have vitamin D status without any numbers uh, inserted for the moment on, on the horizontal axis. But as vitamin D status improves going to the right, uh, we want to see whether insulin resistance decreases. Well, do you see any decrease there? You can say, well, maybe, um, but we're not really sure. How do we get the effect teased out of all of this noise? Realize that insulin resistance is powerfully determined by being overweight or having too much of a waist circumference or uh, smoking or any number of other factors which, uh, uh, which could influence insulin resistance. And we're looking for only one factor in this snowstorm of information, that is uh, vitamin D status. Well, we had to take some particular statistical tools to, to bring that to our attention. And you can see here in this red line that I've drawn through the center of the data that this is, in fact, where the effect lies. It's not a big effect. Nutrients don't have big effects, as a matter of fact. But the problem is we need to see where it's located and what change in vitamin D status is important. Now, we had to work out specific statistical tools. I won't bore you with them, but here's what it came down to when we got all through. Here we see uh, uh, insulin resistance on this uh, vertical axis for all individuals who had values up to a certain level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D, the way we measure vitamin D status. That's up to about 40 nanomoles per liter. Uh, that translates to about 16 nanograms per milliliter. And then up here, somewhere above, say, 90 nanomoles per liter or above 36 nanograms per milliliter, again, we see something flat. On both of these regions, uh, there was no association between vitamin D status and insulin resistance, either here or there. And it was in between these two that we saw the transition. So this is where the upswing of the sigmoid curve was occurring. In fact, because we're looking at harm, the sigmoid curve goes down rather than benefit taking it up. But this is still an S-shaped curve. It's just backwards. Fascinating feature of this is that this response was confined to just about 20% of the physiological range for vitamin D status. And most of the rest of the range, you could see no additional effect of giving more vitamin D. And if you've done a study out here, just as, as with calcium intake in the Women's Health Initiative, you would have said, well, it didn't have any effect. Well, of course it had an effect. It's just that you had already gotten it and you were past the point where you could see it. And now they were being sustained there, but you couldn't. Get it. The more vitamin D you added, it uh, didn't give you any, any additional effect. So to kind of wrap this point up, it's important to understand that nutrient responses vary with basal status, with the dose or the intake of the nutrient, and <clears throat> with the body system that you're looking at, with each one being specific and having a different sensitivity. Now, these are important. I mean, you might wonder why I'm stressing all of this. Uh, these are important because when we come to look at the studies that have been published, if they didn't pay attention to these things, then you may well get an answer that says, well, vitamin D doesn't have much of an effect. And, of course, that would be totally wrong. And so uh, uh, it's very important to work out these rules or guidelines to allow us to interpret studies correctly. Now, another example of this problem that we have in this troubled relationship is, is the sodium story, which was revisited again just this past year. Uh, in May of 2013, the Institute of Medicine reissued its recommendations for dietary sodium intake and essentially said uh, that the previous recommendations published in 2005 were too low and there was no evidence that going down there produced any benefit at all. Uh, this, this was not popular with a lot of people who had invested a lot of time and effort into reducing sodium intake, but that's what they said. And let's look at some of the reasons for that. We can go back here again for well over 20 years here. Salt made the, the man of the year, as it were, on Time magazine, the whole cover. Uh, the issue was devoted to that. 
we've been talking about salt in our diet since 1972 when the first Dietary Guidelines for Americans mentioned that uh, we needed to be concerned about sodium intake. But they didn't get specific until 1980 or 90, uh, and in all of their issues over that 10-year period, they said, well, we should use salt in moderation. And then in 2000, in 1995 up to 2005, the, the uh, several issues of the Dietary Guidelines said we should get less than 2,400 milligrams per day. And finally, in, in 2010, the recommendation was everybody should be under 2,300, and if you're an older, if you're a senior, you should be under 1,500 milligrams per day. Now, now, we're dealing here with a situation, again, where we've got this risk of harm rising on deficiency and risk of harm rising on toxicity on the right-hand side. So it's kind of a U-shaped or J-shaped curve. It turns out that in determining the sodium intake recommendations, the Institute of Medicine's panels had always assumed that the, the line relating intake to harm was a straight line, and that there was no point on that line where further reduction in, the, in intake wouldn't reduce harm to some extent. So the, the presumption, therefore, is that any decrease in intake reduces risk or severity of cardiovascular disease at all salt intakes, whether high or low. Now, there's real risk reduction up here, no doubt about that. That's a high sodium intake, and that can be harmful for you. Not for everybody, but for a lot of people it is. Now, this risk reduction was applied down here. It turns out there would never been any studies that looked at whether it made a difference down here or not. And for that reason, authoritative sources such as Drummond Rennie, who was the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association in the 90s, said you can say without any shadow of doubt that the authorities pushing this eat less salt message had made a commitment to salt education that goes way beyond the scientific facts. That's, that's putting it gently. There were no scientific facts backing a reduction in salt intake down into that low range. Once again, our, our curve is very helpful here. Now, this shows what happens in diagrammatic form if we reduce sodium intake from a starting value that's up at the high end of the intake range. Of course, we get a reduction in risk. Nobody would argue that. But the same reduction in salt intake down here toward the left-hand side of the diagram produces not an improvement in risk, but an increase in risk. There's more harm down there than there would be if you hadn't tried to reduce salt intake at all. Now, that's typical of essentially all nutrients. And the question is, does it really apply to sodium, or is this just a theoretical consideration? Well, just a couple of years ago, we began to see the evidence piling up. This is a paper that was published in Diabetes Care, and it looked at mortality as a function of sodium intake. Sodium intake is documented by measuring how much sodium comes out in the urine every day. Because we can't store sodium, if we take it in, we absorb it, we have to excrete it so it comes out in the urine. So urine sodium excretion is a good measure of salt intake. Uh, and you see immediately that the risk rises on both ends of the curve, the risk of mortality, of dying. The normal range, the minimal risk range, where the, halo, where the hazard ratio is 1.0, is in this range of, of 100 to 200 millimoles per day. That's 2,300 to about 4,600 milligrams of sodium per day. So that's above the, the 2,300 point that the Institute of Medicine said we need to get under. And the uh, current recommendation uh, is for an, for, for an intake here. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, the 1,300 for elderly individuals. That was not the only such study. Just last year, this study was published in the European Heart Journal. It was the composite of cardiovascular death, stroke, myocardial infarction, and congestive heart failure pooled from 14 cohort studies uh, uh, comprising a total of over 150,000 individuals uh, in, in whom urine sodium was measured. And this is the hazard ratio, that is the risk of having a, a, a cardiovascular death or stroke or, 
or heart attack or congestive heart failure. And you see, just as in the other diagram, that risk rises uh, on both ends of the curve. Uh, too high a salt intake, obviously risk uh, rises. Too much salt is bad for you. Too little salt is bad for you as well. Your risk of dying has increased here by about 30% toward this left-hand end. There's where the, the lowest risk is, and it's in the range of 4 to 6 grams or 4,000 to 6,000 grams per day, essentially what we showed just a couple of minutes ago. There's obviously going to be some uncertainty, and that uncertainty is indicated by the dashed lines around this, this, uh, this regression relationship. So that's why last May the Institute of Medicine issued new guidelines for American salt intakes. They stated that recent studies had provided compelling evidence that salt intake in the range that they had recommended in 2005 could actually increase heart-related illness and death. And I've just shown you those two slides which show that that's so. So uh, in a dramatic reversal, because the Institute of Medicine rarely does this, the, the 2013 recommendation acknowledged that there was no evidence that reducing intake below 2300 was beneficial. Uh, you, you, you might have thought that that was the end of the story. Well, unfortunately, there's politics in everything. And this is a copy of a letter from Harvey Feinberg, who's president of the Institute of Medicine, directed to Kathleen Sebelius, who's Secretary of Health and Human Services, sending her a copy of the final report of the IOM on sodium, published in May, as I said, of 2013. And in this, he writes to her and says, the evidence linking sodium intake to health outcomes supports current efforts by the Centers for Disease Control and other authoritative bodies to reduce sodium intake in the United States below the current average. Now, there's not a word in the report that supported that statement, and I think Harvey Feinberg had to have hoped that Kathleen Sebelius was too busy to read the full report. It was a big report. It would have taken her a lot of time to find that this wasn't in there. So in fact, he was covering up something. Uh, there's a powerful lobby that says we need to reduce salt intake despite the fact that the evidence isn't there. Is that an instance of a troubled relationship? I think it is. My next topic is the foolishness of insisting upon randomized controlled trials. I'm only gonna give you one example here. This is a study published last year in the journal Pediatrics. Uh, it, uh, it studied 740 uh, three Australian pregnant women um, who had their babies and they went on uh, to go to school and they looked for language skills at age five and age 10 in school. And they recorded the results as a function of maternal 25-hydroxy-D quartile, that is first, second, third, or fourth quartile of vitamin D status from low to high. Uh, and here's what they found. This is the prevalence of language impairment at age five expressed as percent. And you'll see here, that in the lowest maternal vitamin D quartile, 13%, one out of uh, just about every seven kids had some degree of language impairment uh, on the, in their first year in school, whereas those in the highest quartile, only 3% did. Where were those quartiles? Well, the lowest quartile was 6 to 18 nanograms. The highest quartile was 29 to 62 out here. 29 is below where we would recommend as the lower end of the normal range. Probably should be about 40 nanograms per milliliter, but it slops over into that healthy range and it gets up to as high as 62 nanograms. And you can see there is a, um, uh, uh, an appreciable difference there. Now, you say, well, there are lots of reasons why people could have low vitamin D status and could have learning impairment in their kids. They could have problems with socioeconomic status. They could have problems with general malnutrition. They could have problems with poor learning environments and bad schools. All of those things could be a factor. And so the authors concluded their paper by saying the randomized controlled trials of vitamin D are required to verify these observational data that suggest that an adequate maternal vitamin D status is necessary for optimal language development in pregnancy. And I stress that randomized controlled trials are required. Now, think about it for a moment. How would you do that? How might that be done? Well, let me tell you how it would be done. 
uh, if you could do it. That is, you would find yourself a group of pregnant women with 25 hydroxy D values below 18 nanograms. That is comparable to those who were in the lowest quartile. That's where the major risk was. Then you would supplement some of them with additional vitamin D while keeping the others at their deficient level throughout pregnancy and lactation. Just amazing. That's clearly unethical. And the ethics committee wouldn't allow you to do that. And even if you could twist your conscience so that you could somehow find a way to justify that, you'd find it was unfeasible. You couldn't get the women to come in at that low status. They just don't do that. And secondly, you couldn't get them to stay there. And frankly, I wouldn't want them to stay there because we know it produces harm. Now, why do we insist on randomized controlled trials? Well, they're absolutely necessary for the evaluation of efficacy for foreign agents, that is, drugs. And by the evaluation of efficacy, I mean, does it work? Does it do what it's supposed to do? But unlike drugs, efficacy is not the issue with nutrients. All nutrients are efficacious. They wouldn't be a nutrient if they weren't efficacious. A nutrient is something you need that the environment provides that you can't make for yourself. So clearly they're efficacious. That's what it means you need them. So the question is not whether they're efficacious, but for what outcome and for how much. And it turns out that randomized trials are poorly suited to answer such questions. Randomized trials lack the sensitivity to detect real-world differences in the gradual approach to normal that you would see at the top of that S-shaped curve. And they're ethically problematic as they require placing subjects on intakes that will produce harm. Uh, if not from the, 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 the disease being tested, then from some other outcome because you have to put them on a deficient intake so they're not getting enough of something they need for some outcome. A control group must have an intake that's low enough that its members develop the bad outcomes that the higher intake is presumed to prevent. You can see why that's, a, that's, that's ethically problematic. And furthermore, if you, if you really think clearly about what you're doing here, the underlying hypothesis is not that a certain intake of a nutrient prevents or ameliorates disease, but instead that low intakes of this particular nutrient cause disease. So you're testing an hypothesis of disease causation or harm. You can't do that in humans. To continue to insist on randomized trial evidence for such endpoints guarantees not that we'll get certain answers, only that we'll stay stagnated, high-centered, because the needed randomized trials often can't be done. Now let me conclude with a brief look at study requisites for nutrients. These requisites flow pretty directly from the sigmoid curve that we looked at uh, uh, earlier. Now for a nutrient study to be informative, basal nutrient status has to be determined before you enter somebody into the trial, and it has to be used as an inclusion criteria. That is, you need to know where they are on the intake continuum. Where, what is their nutrient status? The change in intake has to be large enough to change nutrient status meaningfully. If you don't budge that status much, it won't get much of an effect, no problem. The change in nutrient status, not change in intake, has to be the independent variable in the hypothesis. You might give something to somebody if they didn't absorb it very well, then it, of course it couldn't work in them. So you have to be able to measure the nutrient status. You have to be able to measure the change in nutrient status. You have to be able to quantify that. And finally, co-nutrient status must be optimized. That is, the other nutrients that go along with it have to be optimized as well. I'm going to stress that one because the others all flow pretty much from the sigmoid curve, but this one is a different issue entirely. Uh, and I want to start with a study that was published now 16 years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine from Bess Dawson Houston and her colleagues in Boston who had a cohort of nearly 800 healthy elderly Bostonians, men and women, who were randomized to receive either calcium and vitamin D or a placebo. Uh, and you see that uh, the ones that got the calcium and vitamin D had an improvement in their femoral neck bone mineral density, and those who got the placebo had deterioration. This, of course, we've known for a long time. It's, it's why calcium intake is important for bone, basically. This is just an illustration. 
And on the right-hand side, we see the uh, cumulative incidence of the first non-vertebral fracture. And in the placebo group, you're up here so that by 36 months, the end of the trial, about 13% of the individuals had sustained one fracture, whereas those getting calcium and vitamin D, only about less than 6% had sustained a fracture. There was a 55% reduction in fracture risk just from calcium and vitamin D. Now, Bess subsequently went on to look at what happened uh, within these groups. Here in the placebo group, she looked at change in total body bone mineral density as a function now of protein intake, low tertile, medium tertile, high tertile. And you see the higher the protein intake, the greater the tendency for bone density to decline. This is what we used to think was the problem with high protein intake. We thought it was a risk factor for osteoporosis because under the circumstances, it looks very much as if it causes you to lose calcium, lose bone as a matter of fact. But then Bess went a step further and looked at what happened with those getting the calcium and vitamin D supplement. Once again, as a function of protein intake, low tertile, medium tertile, high tertile. Notice that the low and medium tertiles protected against bone loss. There wasn't any of this bone loss going on. So calcium and vitamin D was clearly working there, but they weren't adding any more bone. They weren't replacing any of the bone they had lost. And only at the highest protein intake was their actual bone gain. How high was that intake? Well, the third tertile started at 1.15 grams per kilo per, uh, uh, per day. It's useful to recall that the recommended dietary allowance for protein is 0 0.8 grams. So this is almost 50% higher than the recommended dietary allowance. So protein is important for bone. And that's not surprising because 50% of the volume of bone is actually protein. And only about 20% of the volume of bone is, is, is calcium. So it's not surprising uh, that protein would be necessary in order to get bone gain. But the key here is that calcium and vitamin D and protein all interact constructively on bone so long as the intakes for each are adequate. And the skeletal effects of a single nutrient may be blunted or obscured if the intake of the others is inadequate. Thus, with calcium intake or protein intake, you were getting the wrong relationship if you didn't have an adequate calcium intake to allow the protein to have something to go into it. So these nutrients interact, and if you're going to test whether calcium works, you've got to optimize not just the calcium intake, you've got to optimize all the other nutrients that are necessary for bone, or you won't be able to tell. So that's, a, that's another one of the requirements for a study. And I'm sorry to have to tell you, but almost no studies have attempted to do that. That's one of the reasons why we have such a mixed bag of results. Now, one of the things we tend to do is to take studies such as those that I've just described and pool them to bring them together in what are called systematic reviews so that you get much larger samples and you can see uh, if the effects of one average out the effects in the other, etc. And so uh, I've designed a number of studies or a number of, of features of a systematic review that have to be met. And I stress those are biological features. Generally, systematic reviews are done by people who look only at methods and see what's reported in the paper, not at the underlying biology. Uh, but the biological features are critically important. So the included studies, that is the studies that you're going to analyze in a systematic review, have to meet the five individual study criteria we just talked about. Have to have the same basal nutrient status. Have to have the same change in intake or dose have to have the same co-nutrient status, have to use the same form of the nutrient. Many nutrients come in different forms, and they're not all equally efficacious. And finally, they have to have the same duration of observation. Now, how have we been doing with systematic reviews? Well, any relaxation of these criteria biases, biases the result toward the null, that is, tends to find that the agent concern doesn't have much of an effect. And over the past, they, they, past two plus years, there have been 64 systematic reviews published for vitamin D alone. That's an average of 2.4 reviews every month for the past two plus years. None 
of these met more than one or two of the six criteria. The others were notably lacking. This is also true, of course, for the earlier prior reviews on which the Institute of Medicine had relied and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force had relied, both of which have issued um, uh, uh, new reports for calcium and vitamin D in the past uh, two or three years. So it's not surprising that their results have tended toward the null. To wrap up, nutrient effects are small. We have to understand that. That means that, that, that we have to have special skill in designing a study to find them. Secondly, randomized trials are ill-suited to detect or to quantify what nutrients actually do. Third, the sigmoid character of nutrient response creates both opportunities and problems for detecting nutrient effects. Next, both individual studies and systematic reviews must meet stringent biological criteria if they're to be informative. By informative, I mean if they're going to give us answers to the question about whether a nutrient has a particular effect or not. And finally, nutrition needs to develop physiological criteria using means other than randomized controlled trials, which we've seen don't work very well for nutrients. Uh, and with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm frequently asked, uh, how can I explain medicine's skepticism about nutrition? Well, I'm not sure that anybody knows exactly what the full answer is, but uh, there are some suggestions I can offer. Uh, first of all, medicine is slow to adopt something that doesn't provide immediate feedback. If you have a patient with an infection and you give the patient an antibiotic and the antibiotic cures the infection, then you see that you've got an effect and, and, and your action has been reinforced. But as I stressed earlier, the primary role of nutrition is really one of preventive maintenance of our bodies in the same way that changing the oil and the filters and lubricating the joints in our car um, keeps the engine running at peak performance. Uh, if you fail to do that, the engine doesn't break down next week or even next month or perhaps next year or two. But sooner or later, all the parts wear out sooner and you begin to get all of the ailments of an aging car. And, and uh, presumably, you'd like to keep the engine purring smoothly uh, throughout its useful life. Uh, the same is true about the human body. Uh, if we have bad nutrition, it it doesn't change for the most part how we function tomorrow or next week. I think all we have to do is look at our teenagers and see uh, that you can have really strange or bad nutrition uh, and, and still get still get away with it uh, in the short run. But there is a cost in the long run. Uh, and until physicians uh, are intellectually convinced of that, they're probably going to be skeptical about nutrition because they tend to think of nutrients in the same way they think about the medications they prescribe. Uh, if it doesn't seem to have a clear effect that I can sense, then uh, why do it? Uh, it? It just takes a lot of reinforcement uh, to, uh, to maintain a positive attitude about nutrition. Really, the only medical specialties where uh, I think there is clear recognition of the importance of nutrition would be during pregnancy and uh, during the very early years of an infant's life because their bad nutrition has immediately apparent effects. Uh, some of them uh, are sad, but at least we know what they are. And so that reinforces the behavior of neonatologists and geobstetricians as well. But for the rest of us, uh, we have to be intellectually convinced because we don't get the positive feedback of, hey, we've really helped. You know, This has made a difference in my patient's life. Even though it probably has, it just won't be apparent to you. That's one of the, one of the aspects of the fact that nutrient effects tend to be small. When we think of nutrition as related simply to the outspoken diseases like rickets or scurvy or beriberi or pellagra or any of the the classical nutritional deficiency diseases, we really miss about 85% of the iceberg, which is underwater. Uh, most of the effects of nutrients are not uh, in the arena of producing the outspoken diseases like scurvy and rickets. 
Uh, it's for the maintenance of the bulk of the organism and helping it respond optimally to the stresses and strains of everyday life. Uh, that's that's where the uh, effect is. And uh, I suspect that's one of the reasons why medicine's been skeptical. Now, I'm also asked about how I, as a scientist, think we should approach the determination of uh, nutrient intake recommendations or requirements. Well, I have to say there is no consensus in the scientific field about that. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, there is no pre-existing idea of what normal nutrition is. Um, the the approach that, that medical science has taken is simply that, well, uh, an average healthy person is obviously getting enough food, enough good nutrition to meet his or her needs. Uh, and so uh, if you think that uh, they need more of a particular nutrient than they're actually getting, the burden of proof is on you to prove that. Um, but as I say, that's, that's, that's because they presume uh, that, that average behavior, uh, average nutrition, average intake of existing populations is probably adequate. Uh, and so therefore, why change things unless there's very clear proof uh, that the change makes a big difference. But I just saw, I, I just commented a couple of moments ago uh, that the changes are rarely that apparent. And, and so that creates a kind of a, kind of a catch-22. So, so instead of using that kind of an evidence-based approach, uh, I favor totally different uh, ways of getting at this uh, question. Uh, and they need to be different nutrient by nutrient because uh, nutrients are a, a mixed lot. They're not all the same. They don't all act in the same way. Uh, one way uh, to approach this nutrient intake requirement is to notice that the body compensates when we don't get enough of a particular nutrient. It compensates by secreting hormones that uh, conserve the nutrient that we're short on or that that help us extract that nutrient from the diet more efficiently. These compensatory mechanisms are absolutely essential in the long run because even under optimal circumstances, we don't get all of what we need every single day. So we have to have mechanisms to tide us over periods of irregular uh, intakes. Now, uh, if you live by those, what we call rescue mechanisms day in and day out, there is unfortunately a cost because the body, uh, uh, to protect itself in the short run, takes steps that can be harmful in the long run. So these rescue mechanisms are absolutely vital uh, for, uh, for unusual circumstances when we can't get what we need. But you don't want to rely on them um, seven days a week, 52 weeks of the year, time in and time out, because they, those rescue, those rescue mechanisms have costs in their own right. So uh, I like to look at, well, what is the intake that minimizes the need for the rescue mechanisms? What is the intake that makes the, uh, it unnecessary for the body to compensate for our uh, inadequacies of intake? And that intake is the one that seems to be the one that human physiology is fine-tuned to. And that's one way that I would approach determining the intake requirement for a particular nutrient. That works, for example, with nutrients such as calcium and vitamin D. Now, another approach would be to recognize that human physiology is fine-tuned to what the environment provided when the physiology was evolving, in our case, on the equatorial, high equatorial plains of East Africa. Where the where the early hominids uh, uh, developed and uh, and evolved over hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. Well, we don't have a time machine, so we can't go back and measure the total nutrient intake uh, uh, under those circumstances. But we can look at native Africans today who live ancestral lifestyles and see what it is they get. I mean, for example, in the case of vitamin D, which is of great interest to me and to Grassroots Health and, and, and all of its members, uh, that intake of vitamin D is equivalent to what you would get with a, uh, 
a blood level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D in the range of 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. Now that's 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter. Uh, that intake is the one that that, uh, uh, that apparently prevailed uh, when our physiologies uh, were evolving. Now it turns out that that number is exactly, or, or is in in almost exactly the same range as the intake we would calculate if we were looking at what does the body have to do to compensate for low vitamin D intake. What we find when it gets up to the range of 120 nanomoles per liter, it doesn't have to compensate at all anymore. So that's the one that seems to fit vitamin D. So I would I, I would advocate taking that that kind of an approach to as many nutrients as we can, finding the right way to get at this physiologically. Uh, you can't do any of these things with a randomized controlled trial. That's that that's the wrong tool. That's like using a hammer to cut a board. <laughs> it just it's just the wrong tool. Uh, and the fact that hammers can be very powerful and it can be very helpful doesn't mean that that's what we use when we cut a board. So that's kind of the general approach that I would take. Thanks to Dr. Haney and to all of you who have been listening. I hope you will take some of this information to your friends and medical practitioners to help raise the awareness about what a nutrient really is. <clears throat> Our next Scientist Answer Your Questions webinar is scheduled for October the 8th at 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time with Dr. Reinhold Veith of the University of Toronto. Dr. Veith will be addressing the issues associated with evidence-based medicine, public policy, safety, and the health effects of vitamin D, and how do we get a coherent plan. Please spread the word about vitamin D, and we, Grassroots Health, can always benefit from more participation in the D-Action Project. Information is, of course, on our website, grassrootshealth.net. Thanks again. <laughs>